I think I'll just get started. So uh, yeah, after we see all the, the pipeline stuff, um, I think it's time to see how we materialize data in that view. So this is something I've been working on uh, a lot. And typically we don't want to materialize data. So first I'll go over like why we, we materialize data. Then um, this was initially, uh, this presentation used to be like, uh, the idea was kind of an internal presentation. So I go over some internals. If you have any uh, questions, just, just shout uh, at me during the presentation. So I'm just gonna quick go over the buffer manager and then go over two of our um, materialization structures, which are the column data and tuple data collection, and then their partitioned versions. And then uh, I'll try to squeeze in some uh, talk about materialization uh, during execution. Okay, so why, why do we even materialize data? Because materializing data sucks, right? It, it takes time, we like to stream data. So that's the goal, uh, as you saw in Mark's pipeline, we want to stream data through operators like join probes or, or uh, projections, but we can't if the last input row affects the first output row. Uh, so some examples are of this are, uh, let's say, a, a grouped sum. The last uh, input row might affect the sum of the first uh, output row. Same with the order by, uh, the last row in might be the last row out. And then for the join, you have the special case that you materialize one side to fill the hash table and you probe uh, using the other side. So you need all of the, uh, for us it's the right side, you need all of that data to be in there before you can start uh, probing. Okay, so we have to materialize. Uh, how? How do we materialize? We have a storage format, so can we just use that? That materializes data. Uh, it's, I don't think that's a good idea. It's just it's, it's really uh, for long-term storage. So we have compression in there, we have transactions, uh, zone maps, so that's statistics, so you can skip reading some parts of, of the data. It's all nice, but it's really, it's, it's built for fast scans. That's uh, what the columnar, um, columnar storage really is for. And during execution, we kind of want more random access into, these, uh, into the data, and the columnar format, especially the storage format, is not made for this. Um, I'll go over later why we want rows instead of columns. Uh, but there's also this question of what if what do we do if the data doesn't fit memory? While we're streaming, we will never run into memory issues because our batch is pretty small. Um, if when we're materializing, we can have a lot of growing data size. And what if it doesn't fit the memory? Well, you hire a PhD student, which is <laughs> me, of course. Uh, so I'll go over some strategies for a uh, uh, large, or like gr uh, going over the memory limit uh, later, but first uh, a bit on the buffer manager. I'm not sure if you, you have all static allocations, so, but do, do you still have a buffer manager? You still have a buffer manager. Okay, so you know what it is, just quick recap. So our physical operators like joins and aggregates uh, talk to the buffer manager. So they just request blocks. Our blocks are 256 uh, kilobytes. And then the buffer manager says, okay, you can have a block. Uh, you request another one. Okay, maybe now the memory is full. Uh, some other blocks were over there. So the buffer manager offloads some blocks that it has, and then it can give you, uh, it can give you a block. And the operator can say, okay, I don't need the blocks anymore right now, but don't destroy them. I might need them later. So they can go to disk to use later on in the query. Okay, sure, the buffer manager will do that for you. Okay, now I'll go on, on to our, uh, one of our materialization data structures. Uh, go to the column data collection first. We use columnar storage and columnar execution. Um, and we also have a materialization structure for columnar data that, that uses the buffer manager. Um, so materialized data in columnar format uses buffer managed blocks. And we can do zero copy scans on this because all of our data is already in uh, the same vector format as the batches that we use so that's also columnar data so we just say oh here's the pointer to the data and we don't have to copy over on uh, the scan so if this is a block then this would be column one column two column three column four um, and there's one tricky thing here I, I think I suppose you don't deal with strings much but there's a lot of nasty strings in uh, analytical data sets 
and uh, we have a fixed size string type, but of course strings can have any length. So our string type has a four byte length, so that's uh, a 32 bit integer. And then we have maybe a 12 byte string, so it's 12 characters. Or if it's longer than 12 bytes, we have just the prefix of the string and then a pointer to the actual string. So if you look at, at this, this is fixed size, so the string must live somewhere else. Um, so lives on another block, and that's where all the variable size stuff lives. And maybe there's more vectors uh, coming after it. And then, of course, there's um, pointers. And uh, these blocks can be offloaded to the buffer manager. Now, that's a problem, potentially, because we have pointers. So if the block containing the strings goes back, uh, goes to disk, and then comes back, then the strings live on another address. Um, so let's say, let's go over a quick example. So we have, let's say we only have two strings and they're written, written at these memory addresses. We have a little bit of metadata saying that the strings live in block with, uh, with index 42 at offset zero. And we know that the last time we saw this block, the pointer was there. So it seems to be correct. But when we load the block again, we see that the pointer has changed as a mismatch. So we need to recompute all the pointers so that our string type is valid again. So we can just recompute it using whatever pointer we see minus the old base, uh, which is the 128 plus the new base, which is 2048. Um, so here's the, the math. And then you can recompute the pointers on the fly, uh, but only if they went to disk. So only if, if we need to recompute the pointers, we, we will do that. Okay, now on to the other materialization format. Um, I wanted to call this the row data collection, but we already have a class called that. And I'm waiting for that to be deprecated so I can rename this <laughs> to the row data collection because that sounds nicer. Um, so yeah, just very similar to the column data collection, we materialize data in row format. So actually here, instead of whole vectors, we have the whole rows. And uh, on the same blocks we get from the buffer manager, and data has to be called to each other scan because it's not in the vector format that we want it to be. And here we actually make a distinction between row blocks and heap blocks because uh, it's a bit easier this way. So we also have a list type and then that also lives on the heap blocks. And then we use the same trick to recompute pointers on the fly. It's slightly different, but it's the same, same idea. And why do we even want rows in our columnar database system? Well, it's uh, also from research at CWI that has shown that uh, it gives you better cache locality. So when you're doing a join or when you're doing an aggregate, you typically are talking about joining a row with a row or joining or, or grouping all multiple values in the same row. And when you're doing this, it's important to have the data co-located in memory because when you fetch the row, you get all of the values from this column in, in one row. So that's for sorting joins and aggregations, and uh, also for partitioning, this will be useful, which I'll go over in the next slide. So I built two versions of the column data and the tuple data, which are partitioned versions. And so here we get to the question of what if my data doesn't fit in memory? Uh, so that could be like a join or aggregate hash table. We need to match all of the tuples, let's say for a join, from the right side with all of the tuples from the left side. So that might seem that you uh, need to have everything in memory, but we uh, typically partition to make the problem smaller. And a partition is likely fits in, in memory. So we have partitioned versions of the data collections and typically we're, we partition by a few bits of a hash. So we, let's say we interpret the first three bits of a hash as a number, uh, then we have up to eight partitions. So the, column, the partition version of the column data is just a bunch of column data collections and we can append data chunks, which, is, which are our batches. We can append them in flight immediately to these partitions. And uh, the way we do that is with something we call a selection vector. So a selection vector basically selects rows from a batch. So our batch is 2048. We might have a selection vector that selects row zero, row 10, row 11, something like that. Um, the way we do this, we create a selection vector for each partition, and then we use that to 
slice the chunk. So that selects these rows that belong to this partition, and then we append that to the corresponding uh, column data collection. Now, this works uh, reasonably well, uh, but there are some caveats. So if you want to repartition, let's say you pick, didn't pick enough partitions and you need to repartition to more fine-grained partitions to be able to fit the memory, then um, you need to scan this. So you go from column data collection uh, and then append to a different column data collection, uh, which is partition further. And if you have many partitions, you have to do this slice append, slice append many, many times. Um, so this is where the partition version of the row format comes in. And it does a slightly better job at this. So again, we can append this data, which is in flight immediately to partitions. We go from our columnar uh, data to partition row data. And instead of creating multiple selection vectors, we create just a single selection vector for all partitions. And then we ask each partition to build a little bit of buffer space. And then we get all of the pointers for where we're going to write the data. And then we can write all of the data in one go. Uh, it doesn't matter how many partitions there are. Um, you can still write it in one go. And so it deals with some of the caveats. Um, the appends are faster, even if you scale to many partitions. And repartitioning is surprisingly fast because we don't have to go, because uh, the data is not decomposed, we can copy over whole rows instead of going to the individual values in, in the columnar format again. Um, so this is something that, that I've been working on for a long time. Um, of course, if the size of the data you're, you're, uh, you're materializing is smaller, then that would be <laughs> great too. So I also implemented an optimizer uh, called it compressed materialization. I have a thin version of the first <laughs> slide here, uh, which is basically the idea. We make the data thinner. Um, so this is based on the idea that, uh, so what's really, I really like, I'm a bit envious of your fixed schema that you have in, in, uh, in your system, because <laughs> that makes things so much cleaner. Um, we have to deal with random schemas of people, uh, which can suck. So people will create, uh, table with an ID column and they make it a varchar and then they insert all the integers and then yeah they, they think that's that has no harm but of course we know that that's not a good idea so the idea of this optimizer is that types aren't always a tight fit so let's say we have uh, an integer column which is four bytes but we only ins insert these small values of course we know we can fit that in less bytes so um, there could be keep statistics, so min-max statistics, and maximum string length statistics. And with that, we can compress integers and strings. So, um, and we do this actually at runtime. But compressing and decompressing has a cost, so we don't really want to compress uh, the data chunks that are in flight because their memory footprint is small anyway. So compressing this stuff uh, really like costs more than it actually yields. And the, where we really want to do this is when we materialize data, because this is where our memory footprint grows. So if we stay within the memory limit, then we have less um, I.O., right? So less intermediates have to be spilled to this. So the idea for compressing integers, it's very simple. We fit the range of the integers that we have into the smallest integer type that we can, uh, that we actually can. So let's say we have these integers, we sub subtract the minimum and then uh, it already fit into uh, what we have called a u unsigned tiny int, which is just one byte unsigned integer. Um, it already fit in there, but the general idea is we subtract the minimum and fit it into the smallest type. Um, so this gives you a compression ratio of two to 16 X because we go up to um, 128 bit integers and it's very cheap to uh, compress and decompress. It's just to subtract uh, and then a cost or an add and then a cost. And the way this is implemented in DuckDB is that this is just an optimizer. So uh, Mark showed you before some projections. If we see an order by or an aggregate, we push a projection <laughs> under the aggregate that compresses the data. And then after the aggregate is done, we have a projection that decompresses the data. So the operator isn't even aware of this. And then we can easily add this to new operators that might get added. Uh, because it's abstracted away as, as an optimizer. Um, okay, so 
onto strings. I, I like this one a bit more than the integer because uh, there's there's a little trick that you can do. So we can fit integer or strings into integer types as well. So as I showed, the int the string type is 16 bytes, and uh, let's say we have two strings. We have Alice and Bob, and the max string length is is five in our in our data set, and this fits in an eight byte integer. Of course, the five is less than than eight, but our string type is 16 bytes. So going to uh, an eight byte integer is already uh, an improvement. So we have Alice and Bob, and then we pad with zeros, and then we add their length at the end. Now, uh, this is great if we want to do, do joins or aggregations where we have to check strings for equality because it's just an integer comparison now instead of a string comparison. However, if we want to sort these, then we run into a problem because, okay, I think we only support big endian systems. Uh, most systems are big endian. So now if we want to compare these, if these are an integer, then, um, Alice will actually sort after Bob because it's compared from this side to, to, the, to the front. So what we do is we just flip the bytes. So in the compression, we flip it around. And now we have a uh, sortable compressed uh, string representation that we can just use integer comparisons on, which not only makes the data smaller, but also the comparisons uh, faster. So again, same compression ratio, we can go to uh, one, one byte actually, which uh, for, for a famous benchmark is, is very <laughs> useful uh, for us so that we look better. Uh, but the compression and decompression is a bit more expensive than for integers because you have to interpret this length of the string at runtime, whereas for integers, this is all uh, known. So uh, just a quick summary. Uh, we have to materialize data. It sucks, but um, sometimes we go to columns. Usually we go to rows. Uh, when we materialize, we, we have to be able to spill data to disk. So as Mark said, we have like huge queries. Instead of many small queries, we have huge queries that aggregate or sort uh, a lot of data. And uh, when we spill, we can recompute these pointers on the fly, or and we can also do partitioning to make sure that um, the problem size fits memory. And uh, yeah, finally, the runtime compression reduces the memory footprint, uh, but it's only useful when we actually materialize. That's it.